Let's take a common example here from dependent motion, where we have two particles, two positive coordinates assumed, and this is our cable length. And if we take two times the derivative, we will get the acceleration equation, which means that the acceleration in this case have the same direction of SA and the same direction of SB which leads to this relationship between the two accelerations, which simply states that if one of the accelerations is positive, the other one will be negative. So for example, if AA is equal to one meters per second square, then AB becomes minus one half, which means one half, but in the opposite direction. However, and from my experience, this negative sign here causes a lot of confusion. And to avoid this confusion when solving problems, just reverse one of those directions so you can get rid of the negative sign. And now the relation is easier and makes more physical sense. The acceleration of A is twice the acceleration of B. Does it matter if you reverse the acceleration of A or the acceleration of B? No, it doesn't matter at all as long as you can verify that the positive acceleration of A leads to a positive acceleration on B, and vice versa. If we switch the direction of B, then we have also to switch the direction of A so that this positive motion leads also to a positive motion. And now it's time to put our forces and draw our free body diagram and kinetic diagram. So let's start with A. We have the weight, we have the normal force, and let's say that we have some kind of friction because the surface is not smooth. We also have the tension pulling to the right, and with the acceleration, now we can have the free body diagram and the kinetic diagram as shown. And as for B, we have the two tensions trying to prevent the block from falling down. We have also its weight, and we have the direction of the acceleration, which leads to the free body and the kinetic diagrams. Again, if you want to avoid any confusing negative signs between the acceleration of A and the acceleration of B, then do the following. Make sure that the positive motion of A leads to a positive motion in B. This way, we will have a direct relationship between AA and AB, which states AA equals 2AB. And if we have friction in the problem, and before doing anything with the equations, then we have to put our possibilities, which are as follows. First, if the system is moving, so you know from the problem that there is an acceleration, there is a velocity, there is a distance, something physical is mentioned about the motion. Then in this case, the friction is equal to mu k times in A. And let's say that you know from this problem that block A moves to the right and block B moves down. This must be stated in any moving system. You must know the direction of the motion. And in this case, the friction is always against the motion. This is the only way that the friction makes physical sense. If you know the direction of the motion, then the kinetic friction is always against the direction of the motion. But what if nothing is explicitly mentioned about the motion? In this case, look for these keywords. The system is about to move. The block starts to move. The system begins to move. Or what is the initial acceleration of the system or the block? And sometimes you can see that also as a condition such that the block does not slide, or the car does not slip. And all those conditions lead to the same conclusion. The static friction has reached its maximum value, and whatever we have, a system or a block, is about to start motion. And the friction in this case is known, which is mu s times n. What if both mu s and mu k are given? 
and no hint about motion is given. In this case, which is our third possibility, we have to assume no motion and solve the static equilibrium with if as unknown. And by saying static equilibrium, we mean no acceleration in the system. All the summation of forces are equal to zero. And once we solve for f, we have to check for our no motion assumption. If f that we found is less than mu s times n, this means that no motion is occurring and the system is still in static equilibrium. However, if the force of friction that we found is more than mu s times n a, this violates our assumption, which means that motion must occur. And in this case, we have to repeat doing the problem one more time with f equals mu k times n a, and all the summation forces are equal to m a. Okay, let's find the equation of motion for block A, assuming that it has motion. So on the left side, we will have the free body diagram. We have the weight is equal to Na. So this is just summation of forces in the y direction is equal to zero, with Na equals mag. And the equation of motion now, which must take the same positive direction assumed for the acceleration, as we said many times, is equal to ma times aa. So by looking to the right hand side as positive, we have t minus the friction, and the friction is mu k times n, which is mag, and this is equal to ma times aa. And now we have our first equation of motion. For block B, we apply the same procedure. The free body diagram says that we have two tensions and the weight. And by assuming the positive down, which is in the same assumed direction of motion, we have mg positive minus two times the tension is equal to mb times ab. And this is our second equation of motion. And by having our two equations of motion, in addition to the third equation, which is the acceleration relationship, we have a total of three equations and we can solve for three unknowns. Typically, those unknowns are the tension, the acceleration of A, and the acceleration of B. Okay, in some problems, you may have to deal with mechanical springs. And we all know from physics that the force of the spring is equal to the elastic constant K multiplied by S, where S is the amount of tension or compression from the unstretched length. So the unstretched length here is L naught, and L here is the final length. So if we want to find the spring force on this block at this position, and the problem states that the unstretched length of the spring is three meters, the spring force now becomes k times the final length, which is square root of three square plus four square, which is equal to five, minus the unstretched length, which is three meters. And because the spring is stretched, which means it has a final length longer than the unstretched length, the spring will be pulling in from both sides to try to get to its original unstretched position. And that's how we find the direction of the spring force. The other possibility is when you don't have an unstretched length for the spring. So nothing about the length of the spring is mentioned, but the problem says, for example, the spring is currently unstretched and the problem asks you to find the spring force when you stretch the spring or you compress the spring as shown. So here we are compressing the spring with a displacement S, and this means that the spring force now is equal to K times S. And because we are compressing the spring here, it will try to go back to its original unstretched state by pushing the two sides. So it pushes the wall, 
and also pushes this side. And this is how we find the direction of the spring force. Thank you.